All right. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, sequencing a little bit, and then I'm going to talk about basically once you run the sequencer and you have your sequencing reads, what do you do next, uh, which is chiefly a computational problem. So I'm going to touch on some of the computational problems related to that. Uh, I have about 45 minutes worth of stuff, but please feel free to interrupt, especially since I think you've already um, been introduced to some of the things I'll say about sequencing and a couple of the things I'll say about alignment. So feel free to ask questions. Um, so one way of thinking about sequencing is, is, is as analogous to looking at a sample through a microscope. So if you have a biological sample and you want to learn something about it, one thing you can do is place it on a, on a slide, put it under a microscope and look through the microscope, and then what you get is this nice image that's been composed for you by your brain, a nice 2D image where you can just start looking at it and start interpreting what you're seeing. It's a very convenient way to learn about what you're trying to study. Uh, you can also use a sequencer to learn about a biological sample, specifically about what nucleotide sequences uh, are present in a sample. But the problem uh, that you have is a little bit more indirect because you're not getting a nice composed image of what's in your sample. Instead, you're getting this very raw, unprocessed data. You're getting a huge collection of relatively short snippets of DNA that were randomly that were extracted from random positions from within the uh, sample that you sequenced. Uh, so a lot of uh, what today is focused on is what do you do next? When you have this raw data, what can we do to sort of compose it and stitch it into uh, an image that you can sort of make sense of? Um, so in this example, I'm sort of showing the reads sort of springing from the DNA in the cell, but I'm, I think as other people have already explained, there are various ways of capturing nucleotides in the cell, perhaps not from the DNA, perhaps from the messenger RNAs, for example. Uh, but here I'm just showing the, the sequencing reads as though they're coming from the DNA, and everything I'll say today is sort of assuming that the reads are coming from DNA, but a lot of the issues are exactly the same if the reads are coming from RNA or some other piece of the DNA. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, what the sequencer does. Again, I think Rafa's has gone over this, but uh, I'll go over it again, uh, mainly to inform, uh, to remind us of what the data coming off the sequencer is actually telling us, and what are the sorts of things that might be getting wrong. Um, so part of so when we're when we're sequencing things and when we get sequencing reads, we're benefiting from being able to eavesdrop on the process of DNA synthesis. Um, when uh, the sequencer is doing its thing, it's got a lot of single-stranded bits of DNA in there from your sample, and then it's essentially iteratively sort of adding nucleotides and eavesdropping on this process of the nucleotides being integrated along the uh, DNA strand, and in so doing, it's sort of inferring what the sequence of that strand is. And of course, the sequence is going to be a sequence of A, a C's, G's, and T's. The actual process is, uh, works a little like this. If you have your DNA sample, uh, you do some sample preparation, you do some biochemical magic, and then and what you get at the end are these single strands of DNA that are derived from your sample. The initial step sort of takes these strands of DNA and, and fixates them, sort of immobilizes them on this uh, surface. And then there's a step called ridge PCR, which takes those individual strands that were attached here and sort of turns them into these clonal colonies where you have a lot of uh, identical sequences all bunched close together in what's called a cluster on this slide. And then once you have that, you go through this process where you're iteratively uh, introducing a bunch of nucleotides, these guys up here, um, and sort of washing them over that slide so that they can sort of make contact with these uh, clusters. And then depending on which nucleotide is next in the sequence, a particular nucleotide is going to be integrated in, into each cluster. And because these clusters are clonal, because it's all the same sequence within all these guys in the same cluster, all of the templates in the cluster ideally are going to integrate the same nucleotide, and then we can use optics to figure out which nucleotide that was that was integrated into any given uh, cluster. And it sort of goes iteratively. We do it for one position, and then we do it for the second position, and then we do it for the third position. And the output from that stage where we're using optics to see what nucleotide was integrated at each um, cluster gives us output that looks like this, where 
this square is sort of like the slide that we put things on. And each, each uh, dot of light is where one of those clusters is located, and the color of the dot is indicating which nucleotide it was that was integrated. And we get a series of them, one for each sequencing cycle, one for each uh, time we wash the bases over the um, slide. And so if you hold where you're looking on this square constant, like, say we're going to look here in each of these squares. We see this red dot and this red dot and this green dot and this green dot and this red dot and that green dot. That's sort of an indication. That's the indication of what the sequence uh, on that particular read is. So the um, software, the sequencer software, will take a series of images like that. to isolate one of these dots. And at each dot, it will try to figure out what amount of uh, light it's getting in each of the four wavelengths that it's examining. Um, so here, for example, it's seeing a lot of light coming from the wavelength that corresponds to C, and very little light that comes from the wavelengths that correspond to A, G, and T. So in this first position, we're probably seeing a C nucleotide there. Here, the second position, we're seeing a lot from G, a little bit from C, but maybe that's just sort of left over from this first cycle or some other sort of noise. So we might say, okay, well, that's probably a G. And then likewise, we go along. And some of the positions are quite ambiguous. Like here at this position, uh, which they're saying is offset 34, we're seeing a lot of C, but we're seeing a pretty much comparable level of G. So it's hard to sort of disentangle. Was that a C or a G? We probably have less confidence in whatever call we're going to make at that position. But we might still call it a C, for example. So a piece of software is going to do this task of analyzing each cycle for each read to figure out what base is there. That piece of software is called a base caller. And then the output of all this software is eventually this one basically tremendously huge file that's got one uh, set of four lines for each sequencing read for each of these sort of clusters. Each of these clusters corresponds to one of these uh, sets of four lines in this al output file. And each read has a name, which is sort of identifies where it was on the slide, basically. And it's got the sequence that was called by the base caller. And then it's got this red line here, which looks like a bunch of gibberish when you look at this. It's got like Bs and sevens and percent signs and stuff like that. But that's, I'll talk about this more later. That's just basically a way of encoding the confidence that the software has in the corresponding nucleotide up here in the blue line. So in this example here, in the first cycle where C is so much higher than everyone else, it might be very high confidence. Whereas in this cycle here, where C and G are almost tied, it might be very low confidence. And that's what this red string is, is trying to encode. So this is what we get out of the sequencer. It's a huge collection of files that have a ton of these records in them. Uh, really, it's up to billions now. I put hundreds of millions, but that's because these slides are old. We get approximately on the order of less than about 10 billion uh, reads from a 10-day run of a modern sequencing instrument. All right. So we, it's hard to take this and directly interpret it. Right? It's sort of uninterpretable data because it's so fragmentary. It's not telling us anything coherent. If we want to know about is, is a certain gene present or is a certain uh, sequence that we're expecting present in our sample, it's hard to imagine being able to do, deduce just by looking at this file. So instead, usually the next, the next thing we do with this input data is we try to stitch it together or somehow compose it into a longer, more interpretable unit, like actually assemble all the little fragments into the chromosomes that they came from, for example, or into the genes that they came from, for example. So that's the first challenge when you get your pile of sequencing data, is how do you put it all together into a coherent picture that you can interpret like the picture that you just see when you look through a microscope. All right. Any questions so far? I think this is all review. All right. So this problem of stitching uh, the sequences together into more interpretable units you can think of as being analogous to, to uh, putting together a puzzle. Um, when you're putting together a puzzle, the information that you have, or some of the information you have, is the image on each individual puzzle piece, obviously. And when you're trying to put together these sequencing reads, the information you have is the sequence of the reads. So, yeah, all right. So there are basically two ways you can imagine. So, say you have these puzzle pieces. 
you can imagine putting them together in one of two different ways. One of the ways is if you take the box and then take all the pieces out of the box and then throw the box away and don't look at the picture of the completed puzzle. Just try to put the pieces together based entirely on what's printed on each individual piece. And that sort of method for putting the pieces together you could consider a de novo or a from scratch method for uh, assembling the puzzle. Another way to do it though is to actually take the box cover lid and look at the picture. And when you're putting the puzzle pieces where they belong, you're doing so with respect to the picture of the completed puzzle that's on the box lid. It's like you're taking each piece and sort of holding it up to the box, trying to figure out where it came from, and then putting it in the corresponding place in the puzzle. And that's a, you might consider that to be a comparative approach. You're assembling the puzzle with respect to a picture of what the completed puzzle should look like. And so approaches that people use for uh, putting together sequencing reads also fall into these two categories. Um, so let's take the comparative category first. The way you would assemble a puzzle comparatively is you might look at this piece here and you say, okay, well, this looks like the tip of the Vuvuzela here, so I'm going to put it right here. And then you look at the piece down here and that looks like it's maybe a little bit further up the Vuvuzela, so I'm going to put it here. And if you translate that into sequencing reads, what you have is the sequencing reads and then you have some sort of reference, some sort of sequence that you think is the same as or very close to the sequence that you're trying to put together. Uh, and then the way you would put together the puzzle is for each sequencing read, you would try to figure out what's the portion of this reference sequence, this reference genome, that's most similar to my read. And then that would sort of tell you where the piece goes with respect to the reference, where it originated with respect to the reference. So we might do it for that read there, and then we do it for that read there, and we determine that they come from overlapping portions of the genome, and that allows us to see how those two reads relate to each other. Even though the place that we put them was, you know, we only looked at the reference genome to figure out where they go, but we learned something about where they go relative to each other in the process. And uh, on the topic of de novo versus comparative, um, which one, I mean, which one do you think is easier, de novo or comparative? Comparative. And it, it's, it's easy to see because you have sort of strictly more prior information when you're doing something in a comparative way. So it must be, if anything, easier. And in fact, in practice, it's way, 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 way computationally more tractable to analyze sequencing reads in a comparative fashion than it is to analyze them in a de novo fashion. Um, in practice, there are definitely very good algorithms for doing things this way, um, but they generally take on the order of, let's say, weeks to run, and they generally use lots and lots of memory, so you have to use specialized computers to do this sort of analysis, whereas this is, you can do on your laptop, usually. So, as a, just as a matter of practice, people almost always do things in a comparative fashion, if they can. If, the, if, if this is available, they'll choose to do things in that way. All right. So wh how is it that we can even do things comparatively? Where do we actually find this sequence that's back here that we're using as a reference sequence? Um, we can do this because of a fortuitous property of genetics, which is that if you have two individuals of the same species, their genomes will be not identical, but very, very similar. So, for example, if you, if you take two unrelated human beings and look at how similar their genome sequences, sequences are, they're something like 99.8 or 99.9 percent .9 identical. So, this, we get this reference sequence by simply taking an already assembled genome of another individual of the same species as the one that we're studying. And because it's so similar, we can use it as a reference. We can pretend that that's the picture that's printed on the puzzle box lid. Um, and we have a lot of these available because of a bunch of uh, projects uh, that scientists have undertaken to sequence various genomes, including most famously the human genome, mouse genome, the fruit fly genome, a bunch more, honeybee, cow, chicken, rat, corn. There have been literally hundreds of projects to assemble um, reference genomes for a bunch of species, especially... Uh, especially the model species that people tend to study a lot, like human and mouse and rat and roundworm and fruit fly and things like that. All right. 
So I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, this problem of, say we do have a reference genome, and so we can do things in a comparative fashion. Um, how do we actually do that? So on the one hand, there's the problem of trying to figure out, given this read here, where on earth did it come from in this tremendously long sequence here? So I'm showing you probably this is, I don't know, a thousand or so characters here, whereas the human genome, as you may know, is about three billion characters long. So the human genome is probably more than a million times longer than what I'm showing you here. So there's clearly a very difficult computational problem involved in trying to figure out where exactly did this read come from. Uh, but putting that aside for a moment, let's say that we have a couple of hypotheses about where the read may have camp come from. Say somebody else looked very hard at the sequence for us and told us, here's one place that looks a little bit like our read in the reference sequence, and here's another place that looks a little bit like our read in the reference sequence. And then what I'm doing is I'm showing you exactly how the read would line up with this sequence. If we put, sort of put them on top of each other and then tried to line up the characters so that the like characters were opposite each other. So I'm showing you that for this location, and I'm showing you that same thing for this location. Uh, you may have seen things like this before. I don't know if anyone here has used, have, has anyone here used Blast before? Raise your hand if you've used Blast. So okay, so you're very used to seeing pictures like this if you've been using Blast. But even if you haven't, uh, what I'm trying to emphasize here with the colors is everywhere where you see green, there's a match between the two sequences, and everywhere where you see red, there's some sort of mismatch either because it's different characters or because there's a gap in one or the other. Um, so out of these two hypotheses for where the read may have came from, come from, which one do you think is better? Second one. Why do you think the second one's better? Yeah, there's just, there's more matches there. So, you know, if you had the puzzle piece and you were trying to figure out where in the puzzle it came from and there were two different locations and one of them was less similar to the puzzle piece, you would obviously think that the one that was more similar was a better hypothesis. Same deal in this case. All right, so let's say that hypothesis two is correct. There are still these like mismatches and gaps in here. And realistically, there are generally uh, still mismatches and gaps uh, in a sufficiently long alignment of a read to the reference genome. So why is that? Why, isn't it, why aren't they exactly the same? There's two reasons. Yeah, it's not the same person, exactly. So, you know, the fortuitous property of genetics is that uh, two individuals of the same species have genomes that are very, very similar, but not identical. And so there are going to be some positions where the reference genome and the individual that we're sequencing are legitimately different. Uh, but there's another reason. Yeah, the sequencer can make mistakes. So we sort of saw that before when we saw that there were some cycles where it wasn't clear whether there was a C or a G in the read. So clearly, the sequencer can make a mistake. It might say it's C, but really it was G. And in those, those cases will also show up as mismatches or potentially gaps. I should pause and say, when I explained the sequencing technology, I was showing a particular technology. It was the technology that's used in the Illumina sequencer. There are other sequencers. But one of the things about the Illumina sequencer uh, that's of note <coughs> is that when it makes a mistake, it almost always is manifested as a mismatch like this might be a sequencing error. It's almost never manifested as a gap like you see here. And that's sort of a, just sort of a coincidence of how the technology works. You know, the fact that you have these clusters of identical sequences uh, in one place, if you imagine what would have to happen in order for the machine to erroneously report a gap in that sequence, it would have to be a huge coincidence. You'd have to either have one cycle where none of the strands in that cluster integrated the nucleotide, or they all spuriously integrated more than one nucleotide, and that happens very rarely. So in that technology, when you see a gap like this, it's almost always because there is a gap, a legitimate difference between the subject and the reference genome. That's not true for all sequencing technologies, but it is for this one, so that's an assumption we'll sort of stick with today. All right, great. Here's another example. Uh, I haven't circled anything over here, but say we have another read, and here are, again, two hypotheses for where that read may have originated. So which of these is better? Oh, it's kind of a tie, right? They both have one mismatch. So how do we figure out which one's the better hypothesis? Well, <coughs> if we go back, 
How do we break the tie? So again, I explained previously why the sequencer might be more likely to make mistakes at certain positions than at others. So for example, at this first position here, we can be pretty darn confident that C is the base that we saw because the signal we got for the C wavelength was so much higher than all the others. Whereas here, we're pretty, we're not as confident because C and D are almost tied. Uh, and then I explained why that there are these quality scores. Uh, so in, in this particular format, this is the FASTQ format, by the way, which is a very common format that these reads come in. These quality scores, as I said, they're encoded as these ASCII characters, these characters like B or, or equal sign or percent sign. But really, all they, uh, all they stand for are integers that are usually in the range of 0 to 40. And these integers encode a kind of confidence score. Uh, so the integer is basically calculated by, first of all, the sequencing software estimates this P, which is the probability that it got the base call wrong. It's estimating the probability that it's wrong about which nucleotide it's reporting. And then we take minus 10 times the log base 10 of that, and that gives us, and then round it off, and that gives us a quality score that's an integer. And the interpretation of this integer would be, for example, if the integer is 10, that means there's a 1 in 10 chance that we got the wrong base call. If it's 30, that means there's a 1 in 1,000 chance that we got the wrong base call. So a higher Q means higher confidence in the, in the call that the sequencing software made. Um, so positions that have a high Q are probably correct. And positions that have a low Q may be incorrect. Excuse me. Yeah, and these cues are estimated by the sequencing software. And, you know, God only knows how they, how they estimated those things. Sometimes they're going to be wrong. But at any rate, let's say, let's say for a moment that we trust those. All right, so back to our example. Let's say that in this top example, where's my cursor? Anyway, in this top example, the quality value at this position is 30. The quality value here at this position is 10. So now, which, which hypothesis is more? Likely. It's actually two. It's the one where the machine was less confident in the, in the call that it made. Uh, not the one where it was more confident in the call that it was made. Where the call was made. Lower Q means less confidence. Higher probability that it was wrong. Um, so we're more confident that it's wrong. Right? We're more confident that the G is wrong. Yeah, here, that's right, there's a higher probability that you is wrong. Yeah. All right, here's another, here's another scenario. Uh, which of these is better? So in this case, we have a gap, and in this case, we have a mismatch. Again, it's kind of a tie. We don't really know which one's better. But if we think a little bit harder about how often gaps are likely to happen and how often mismatches are likely to happen, we might be able to guess. Um, so say we have some sort of penalty scheme that's trying to capture those, those uh, probabilities that we get a gap or that we get a mismatch. Uh, again, because we're uh, talking about a certain type of sequencing technology that almost never spuriously reports gaps, we're going to assume every gap is real. So the probability of seeing a gap is, let's say, the probability that there's a legitimate gap between the subject genome and the reference genome. And for humans, there's actually quite a wide range of estimates for how often these occur, shockingly. But um, a decent estimate is that they occur at something like one in every 10,000 or so positions. I think the lower end of this range is more uh, commonly accepted these days than the high end of the range. Uh, so if it were 20,000, then the sort of minus 10 log 10 of the probability of seeing a gap would be around 45. So let's use 45 as sort of our penalty for seeing a gap. So our penalty associated with that topmost alignment up there would simply be 45. There's one gap, so we're going to penalize it at 45. Um, single nucleotide changes or single nucleotide polymorphisms occur in humans at something like one in every 1,000 positions. Uh, but then again, there's this other reason why we might get mismatches, which is that the sequencer miscalled the base. So we might say that a good way to penalize a mismatch is to take the mid, sort of the min of those two penalties, the minimum of those two. So there's the penalty uh, that we would assess 
assuming that it's wrong because the sequencer got it wrong, and then there's the penalty we would assess, assuming that it's wrong because there's an actual legitimate difference between the two. How do we, how do we synthesize those two bits of information? One way to do it is to take the minimum. I'm not advocating that as being the most principled way, but that's one way we could do it. So for this read here that has a gap here, but then also has a mismatch at this position where there's quality 10, what would be the penalty? Yeah. Right. So if we had a bunch of redundant information to begin with about one position in the genome, we could go in with a prior expectation as to whether there's a, a uh, you know, a snip there or not. But assuming for a moment that we're just taking each read as it comes independently, we can, we don't have that prior information, so we're not we're only going to use this this sort of very coarse prior information. But you're right. If we knew, for example, that this here's a high quality. If we knew that this is a place that commonly varies between humans, or we observe in other reads that it varies between the subject and the reference genome, we could use that information to get a better uh, penalty, a, more, uh, a penalty more reflective of everything that we know. But let's assume for a moment that we don't have any prior information. We just have this one read. So here, what would the total penalty be? It would just be the gap penalty plus the mismatch penalty, and in this case, the mismatch penalty is going to be the min of 10 and 30, so it's going to be 10. So the total penalty for that middle alignment is going to be 55. And so what's, what's the penalty for this bottom-most alignment? So, so currently, are there any uh, ideal software to predict the in-depth or in-depth? Any ideal software? Yeah. Yeah. There's software. Yeah, there's software for doing that. Um, there, you know, I could tell you the names of some software packages for doing that. One of them's called Pindle. One of them's called Pindle. There's other things like that, and and uh, some software tries to basically call all variants at once, snips and uh, indels. There's a piece of software called GATK that does that, for example. Um, and yeah, there's gaps are a little trickier for reasons that I won't really go into. So like, well, one reason I can give you right here is I put this gap right here, but what would what if would anything have changed if I put the gap in this middle A position instead of this rightmost A position? No, the alignment would have the exact same alignment score. It's just, they're essentially interchangeable. So this is a trick with trying to detect where gaps are is when you stack all those alignments on top of each other and try to figure out where are the gaps. Some of them might disagree about where in the homopolymer the gap goes exactly. Anyway, so that's one example of why it's a little bit harder to call indels, as the question suggested. But um, yeah, so those are a few pieces of software you could use for, for that. All right, so that, that bottom most alignment is going to have a penalty of 30, because we're going to take the min of 30 and its quality value, which is 40. All right, got about. 10, 15 minutes left. So here's another question. Say we have two reads. I don't know why I animated it that way. Say we have two reads, and for read one, we have these two hypotheses. This is the best one. This is the one with the most matches. This is the second best one. So th these are two different places on the reference genome where the read aligns relatively well. And then in this example on the right, I've got a different read, and these are the best two uh, alignments for the read. That's the best one. It's the second best one. So for which of these two reads are we more confident that the best one is correct? Two. Yeah, for two. Because the best is way better than the second best. And over here, the best and the second best are actually pretty similar. So for all we know, this one's correct over here. But we would be very surprised if this one ended up being correct because it's so, so different. So this is another concern that software has to take into account when it's aligning reads is it can't just tell you uh, this one goes here and that one goes there without also conveying, in this case I'm not very confident about that, whereas in this case I am very confident about that. All right. Okay. So I was going to say a word or two about 
how do we actually solve this problem, the problem of finding these hypotheses in the first place? This is the very hard computational problem here. We have this read, we have this reference sequence that's 3 billion characters long. Somehow we have to come up with these hypotheses for where the read may have came, come from, and that's going to involve some sort of pattern matching or alignment. Um, so how many, so before I, before I go there, uh, who here knows like the name of a pattern matching algorithm or an alignment algorithm? Does anyone have a favorite or? Yeah, that's one, bow tie. That's a good, that's a great one. <laughs> Soap, that's another one, yeah. Uh, does anyone know like, an ex like a string matching algorithm? Is there anyone here who's a computer nerd and knows about string matching algorithms? Who know the name of? All right, but everyone here, several people here have probably heard of Smith-Waterman. Probably heard of Smith-Waterman, okay. So Smith-Waterman is an example of a, uh, what you might call a local alignment algorithm. I won't go too much into what distinguishes local versus global versus other types of alignment, but this is a pretty good example of an alignment algorithm that a lot of people use um, and that solves a very well-defined computational problem. So in this case, uh, the computational problem is that we're given two strings, a string P that's called the pattern and a string T that's called the text, and we want to find substrings of P and T that have some, that maximize uh, some optimal global alignment score. And that alignment score is going to come together, that alignment score is going to be calculated by doing something similar to what we were doing when we were looking at those penalties, which is just basically adding up penalties or bonuses for each of these types of events. Uh, whenever a character in the pattern and a character in the text match, we're going to get a bonus of 15. Whenever they mismatch, we're going to get a penalty of 30. Whenever there's a gap in the text, we get a penalty of 30. Whenever there's a gap in the pattern, penalty of 30. And so there's an algorithm that can take P and T and this scoring scheme and find exactly the piece of P and the piece of T that maximize uh, that, that score. And in this case, if we extract out this substring of P and this substring of T and line them up, we get a score of 15. And that's the optimal answer. And the way this algorithm works, and you may have seen this before, is we take our pattern string and put it along the rows of a matrix, and we take the text string and put it along the columns of a matrix, and we start with some of the cells sort of filled in in a very preliminary way. We just put zeros uh, in, in the leftmost column and in the topmost row. And then we proceed to fill in the entire matrix using this very simple set of rules. H uh, stands for the matrix, and so HIJ stands for the I comma J cell of this matrix. And what we're going to do is, when filling in a cell, like this cell here, we're going to consider uh, the cell that's diagonally above and to the left of that cell, and then we're going to consider the penalty that we would incur, or the bonus that we would get, by aligning this character to this character the, uh, you know, i character of the pattern and the j character of the text. In this case, they would mismatch. So we would get a mismatch penalty of minus 30, but we're going to take the max of that at zero, so we're going to get zero in that case. So zero would go in this cell. We're also going to consider the vertical move from up here. We're going to consider what would happen if, um, basically, if this uh, t character occurred opposite a gap character in the text. Um, in which case we're incurring this text gap penalty, and that would bring us down to minus... Oh, I changed the penalty, sorry. They were minus 30 on the last slide, they're minus 40 on this slide. Okay, sorry. So say it was minus 40, but again, we would take the max of that at zero, so we get zero in that case. And then here you all, you're also considering the horizontal contribution from this cell to the left. So in that case, that's like as though we had moved this way, so that's like having the C in the text align opposite a gap character in the pattern. So that would incur this penalty. That again would be minus 40, but we would take the max of that in zero, so we could get zero. And this cell is not very interesting because in all cases we got a negative number and ended up maxing that to zero. But when you fill in the whole matrix, you do get some interesting sort of facts that emerge. So you can sort of see based on where the numbers are high, where the sequences are similar to each other. Um, once you filled in this matrix, 
you can find the optimal answer by finding the cell with the highest value and then working backwards to figure out how you got to that cell. And that shows you the best alignment. So in this case, the best cell is this 90 right here. And we got there by going from this cell to there, doing only matches and mismatches, or only matches in this case. So it's not a very interesting alignment, but this is the alignment that we found. So that's one way of finding alignments and scoring alignments. Unfortunately, it's not terribly useful in practice for analyzing sequencing data uh, because you have to fill in this matrix where the pattern's here, this is the read, and then the entire reference genome is along the top. So that's 300 billion, or 3 billion columns that you would have to navigate in this matrix. So that's, that's really quite difficult. So for example, oh, uh, so you can characterize how much work you have to do here because basically each cell each time you fill in a cell of the matrix, you're doing a little bit of calculation. You're just applying those three rules and figuring out what number to put there. So the amount of work you're doing, if you're aligning D reads that are each of length M to a genome that's length N, is essentially D times M times N. That's how, much, that's how many cells you have to fill in. And you can think of it as a bunch of these matrices sort of stacked on top of each other. M is this dimension, D is the number that you have stacked on top of each other, N is the number of columns. And so if you calculate what D times M times N actually is uh, for a typical run of a modern sequencer, like the Illumina HiSeq 2000 sequencer, which is a common one people use these days, you get this number here, which is very large. Uh, and you can calculate out about how much computing power you would need to solve that quantity of that size of a problem and even if you make a pretty like outrageous assumption about how much how many computers you have available to you to solve this sort of problem you still have to conclude that it takes on the order of years to use this approach uh, to align all of these reads so we can't do it that way in practice so in practice what people do is they use algorithms like soap and bow tie like you said and what algorithms like soap and bow tie do is they take advantage of the fact that we know the sequence of the genome beforehand Right? That's just available sitting on a, in a public database. So we can look at that, and we can sort of analyze the heck out of it before we actually see any sequencing reads in a way that will allow us to do something very quick when the read comes along. And the analogy is this is like the index of a book. Right? If you had to find a topic in a book without an index, you would have no choice but to flip through the entire book. But because you have an index, you can look and see your topic of interest and then see a list of places where you will find relevant information. And we can sort of do a corresponding thing if we have the reference genome sequence beforehand. We can look through it and create a data structure like an index of a book uh, that lets us home in very rapidly on only those portions of the reference genome that might have a good high scoring alignment. And there are various ways that people do this. One of the ways that people do this is very analogous to the index of a book. Um, so for example, if our reference sequence was banana, um, not a very challenging reference sequence to index, but still you can fit it on a slide. Uh, one way to index this would be to take all of the strings, the substrings of length three out of this string, so ban and then Anna and then man and then Anna, and stick them in some sort of data structure. Like in this, I'm showing you a hash table here. Uh, and then with each, with each one of these uh, substrings, there's an associated number, and that tells you the position from which you extracted that substring. So BAN is like the zero at substring, ANA is like the first substring, the one substring, MAN is the second substring, etc. And so what you can do is when your read comes along, you can take all the substrings of length three and then look up each one in this hash table. And that sort of gives you a hint as to where you might want to look in the reference sequence to find similar sequences to the one you're trying to align. So that's one type of index that people use. It's very popular. It's used in a lot of software programs. Blast is, is based on this. A ton of other programs that you've probably encountered if you've worked with sequencing data are based on this idea. But another idea that's a bit more uh, in vogue these days is a suffix index. These are a bit more... These are much harder to wrap your head around, but these are uh, related to some data structures that are used in computer science, like suffix trees and suffix arrays, 
which are ways of taking, uh, say, the reference genome or any other string and taking all the suffixes of that string and then organizing them in some way. So, for example, if you had a, a data structure that had all the suffixes of the human reference genome and they were sorted in alphabetical order, you could imagine now you can do some pretty sophisticated queries to try to figure out what are the portions of the reference genome that are similar to my uh, read. And you can do that in relatively little time, again, because it's sorted, which lets you get where you need to go pretty quickly. All right. So it would be like, so a suffix of banana is banana, another suffix is anana, and then another suffix is nana, and another suffix is anna, another one's na, and then up. And so if you look at all the paths through this tree from, let's see, from top to bottom, each, one, each of the suffixes are represented here. So like the, the, the path consisting of just A, and then for technical reasons it's always, there's always a dollar sign at the end. Esoteric, but anyway, here's the path corresponding to A, here's the path corresponding to NA, here's the path corresponding to ANA, NANA, etc. So they're all in there. And uh, thanks to some uh, miraculous computer science, it turns out that the size of this whole data structure, even though it would look like it would be incredibly large, is actually proportional linearly to the length of this string. You wouldn't really expect that. You would expect it to be super linear somehow. But uh, the fact is, it's actually linear in the length of the string. And a lot of the types of queries that you would do against this are also linear in the length of the query string. So for example, if we had NAN and wanted to, wanted to find out whether that occurred in the string that we've indexed, we can solve that in an amount of time that's linear in the length of the query. So it's proportional just to the length of NAN, not to the length of banana, which might be, might, which might be much larger. So there's some sort of miracles if you pick the exact right data structure for how you might do this very quickly. What's that? This is the offset. So like, for example, this is the zero suffix, the one that starts here. Uh, I don't know, that doesn't quite work, does it? No, yeah, that doesn't work. Yeah. And this is the, you know, one suffix, the one that starts here. This is the Choose the suffix, the one that starts here. It starts with zero because computer scientists like to number things from zero. But um, that just corresponds to where you got the suffix that ends at that leaf node. All right. So that's about all I was going to say. I was going to say if you're interested at all in any of this pattern matching or alignment stuff, there's a ton of great literature. This is a great book, this book by Dan Gusfield. It came out in the 90s. Uh, and it still mostly covers pretty much everything that people actually do uh, when they do sequence alignment of various kinds. But there have, been a, there have been a few pretty important discoveries since then. So for those discoveries, this is a good survey paper um, from Briefings in Bioinformatics. Between these two, you can find a lot of really practical information about these algorithms. Uh, this is a great book. There are other books that cover similar algorithms that start with 40 pages of definitions. You probably wouldn't like those books. I love this one. I think you would, too, if you were interested. So these are two good, good places to go for more information.